I personally feel that there is a giant misunderstanding within the Christian world today as to the determining factor that will allow you and me to enter into the kingdom of God. So today I want to submit some information that I feel each of us need to hear. And I had given a sermon in December, I think it was 13th of 1980, and only a few people, because we had just gotten started as an association, ever heard that sermon. And so I want to rework that sermon today and give this information to you because I feel that it is the heart and the very core of Christianity and what God wants for us. But I want to submit to you that judgment as to who will enter the kingdom of God is going to be based upon your and my treatment of Jesus Christ. And that treatment must be from the heart and that we must be converted from the inside out. It cannot be an external show of religion. It cannot be an external show of religion, but it must be God's Holy Spirit literally implanting within us his way of life and a desire for that. Now, how can this be, though, that our entrance into the kingdom of God will be based upon our treatment of Jesus Christ and that from the heart? You and I have never once seen Jesus Christ. He died over 1,900 years ago. He was buried, he was resurrected, and then he ascended to the Father where he is right now. We have never seen Jesus personally. So how is it that our treatment from the heart of Jesus Christ will determine our entrance into the kingdom. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, I want to start with verse 31 through 46. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. This is when Jesus will arrive. He's going to sit on his throne and notice what he's going to do. And before him shall be gathered all nations and he'll separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He that set the sheep on, the, on his right hand, and then he'll set the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. So here is somebody that is going to inherit the kingdom. And this is going to be prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So Jesus and God the Father, in the beginning, prepared a plan. And that plan is being worked out today. And he's going to have two groups of people here. One on his right hand and he's going to tell them to inherit. Verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we you hungry? and fed you or when were you thirsty and I gave you to drink verse 38 when saw we you Jesus Christ a stranger and took you in or when were you naked and we clothed you verse 39 or when did we see you sick and in prison and when did we come to you and when did we visit you and the king shall answer and say unto them verily I say unto you in as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. That is vital for our understanding. Verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So here is two opposite actions. One group of individuals actually served Jesus' brethren when they were in need. Others did not serve those brethren. One served from the heart, the disciples of Jesus Christ, when they were in need. And yet the other group turned their back upon the disciples of Jesus Christ, their brothers and sisters in Christ, and did not furnish anything for them. Let's go on down to verse 42. For I was not hungered, and you gave me no meat. Here are the ones that are going to be cast into this lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they answer unto him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or a thirst, a stranger, naked, sick, in prison? It did not minister unto you. And here's Jesus' answer. 
and it's very gripping and we've got to understand it verily I say unto you inasmuch as you did it not to one of these least of my brethren you did it not to me and these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal Brethren, I believe the greatest need right now, not just in our association, but in all churches that profess Christianity, is that they must develop a, not just religion, but they must develop an affection for Jesus Christ and for those that are his disciples and follow him. And it can't be an outward display of the flesh. It can't be. It must be from the heart and a desire to serve other people when they're in need. In Psalms chapter 7, Psalms chapter 7, verse 8 to 10. The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to mine integrity that's in me. O let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just, for the righteous God tries the hearts and reins. Look at verse 10. My defense is of God, which saves the upright in heart. God is looking at the heart of men and women. He is not interested in the external show. He's not interested in that at all. Because he's already raked the scribes and Pharisees over in Matthew chapter 23 concerning the outward show of religious activity. He's not interested in that. He's interested in a heart that's going to convert you from the inside out so that everything you do will be a direct result and an outward appearance of your internal thoughts and concepts. And Psalms chapter 10, verse 17. Lord, you've heard the desire of the humble. And this is the key to starting the transformation of our life from that of an outward show of just religion and conversion from the heart. First of all, we must humble ourselves. You will prepare their heart. So it's God that's going to work a miracle in your heart to change you. You will cause your, thine ear to hear. So there must be a humbling of our hearts and our minds before God can even start to prepare an upright heart that's going to be converted for Jesus Christ. And you're going to have to have this preparation first and this humbling before you will even have a desire to serve and help your brethren or Jesus Christ. In Psalms chapter 12, Psalms chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Help, Lord, for the godly men cease. King David realizes, oh, hey, where are the godly people who are looking to Jesus Christ or looking to the Savior? For the faithful fail from among the children of men. They're becoming a minority. Verse 2. They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips. Notice that, flattering lips. And with a double heart do they speak. Godly people are becoming a scarce commodity. They are the minority in the world today. The evil speak with a double heart. They have a double standard. They have an outward display in front of people, but inwardly they do the exact opposite. They say one, per one thing to one individual or to one group of individuals and then they'll turn around when that group of individuals know nothing about what they're doing and then they'll speak or say something else to appease that group. They're called politicians today. But anyway, <laughs> that's also within our own nature. And God is going to have to delve inside of us, first of all, after we learn to humble ourselves first so that God can begin to prepare our hearts to serve him. Now in James in the New Testament, right after Hebrews chapter 3, verse 2 through 10. For in many things we offend all. And he's talking to Christians because when you look back at the very first part of James, verse 1, James is writing to the 12 tribes of Israel scattered abroad. And so he's talking to all of us. In many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. He's able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may be obey us. And we turn about their whole body. 
Behold also the ships, which though they are so great and driven with the fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the gover governor lists. So here's the captain up there, and he turns it with just a little steering wheel. This great, huge, massive ship. Even so the tongue, and every person has a tongue, is a little member, and it boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. Why? Because the tongue will only speak what the heart is actually thinking. And when I say the heart, I don't mean the organ, the pump, the heart that pumps blood. I'm talking about the mental capacity of an individual, the mind, the intellect for which we communicate with each other. So the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. In other words, he's saying, look, the tongue and the mind that we have is the very heart and core of all problems that we have. And unless we learn to control the tongue, which only speaks out of the motivation of the heart, then we are going to end up being burned in the lake of fire. Verse 7, For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It's going to take a miracle from Jesus Christ and God the Father, His Holy Spirit, for us to be converted from the inside out. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therefore, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men. See the double standard? We say one thing to God or our fellow brothers and sisters and then turn around behind their backs and then gossip or run them down behind, behind their backs, which are made after the similitude of God. Remember I said that I want to submit to you that our entrance into the kingdom will be how we treat Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is the very epitome of God the Father and you and I are made in the very image of God and it's how we treat one another representing Jesus is what's going to determine our entrance into the kingdom verse 10 out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing my brethren these things ought not so to be it's going to take conversion conversion and it will take God's Holy Spirit to tame this tongue. But of course, the taming of the tongue only comes after the heart is changed. Amen. Only afterwards. Now, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 to 37. This is going to get quite interesting now. I believe, personally, as I was studying this, I got a little excited about it. Matthew 12, verse 34 to 37. O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? He was talking about the religious leaders of that day. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. God doesn't change. He knows our hearts. He knows that 20th century Christians and the world is no different than they were back then. We just have modern technology, that's all. And so out of the abundance of our heart, Many things we say out of our mouth we really mean, even though sometimes we even say it in joking and jest. It's a cover-up so that it won't hurt the other person's feeling. Now, not always. You can always joke and have a good time with each other. But many times, even in joking and jesting, it'll bring out the true intent of the heart towards someone else. Verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by the words you shall be justified. See, it's our words, and our words only come because our intellect, our mind, our heart is really thinking those things. And by your words you shall be condemned. This is very interesting because we can put on an outward appearance to other people of religion. And if it's not a conversion from the heart, 
you have no stature and standing in the sight of God whatsoever. Amen. See, you can have all truth. All truth. You can understand the Sabbath day. You can understand all of his holy days. You can understand the laws of clean and unclean meats. But if your heart is not right with God, you're the biggest zero because you have truth. You see, here are people out here that don't even know the truth. And when they have a more sincere and right heart before God, I believe he honors that more than he will us if we have truth and a rotten heart. Because more is required of us if you have truth and the wrong spirit that goes with that truth. In Psalms chapter 24, Psalms 24 verse 1 to 4. Psalms 24, verse 1 to 4. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? This is a tremendous question. Every person that's ever professed Christianity wants salvation. They want to be where Jesus Christ will end up being. Wherever his throne will be, that's where they want to be. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Who, shall not be lift, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. So clean hands and a pure heart. These are the people who are going to be in the very presence of Jesus Christ. And until that pure heart is achieved, we are never going to be able to control our tongue or our hand. You know, you can write things. You may not say them verbally, but you can write things. And it is straight from the heart, just as sure as if you were standing before somebody and speaking them with your own mouth. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You see, it's the pure. They're literally going to see God because of the purity of their heart. Nobody on the face of the earth is going to see God unless that pure heart is attained first. Now, in John chapter 3, John chapter 3, it makes a very clear statement as to who is going to see God. First of all, the pure heart. Start in verse 1. Let's go through verse 8. There was a man, a Pharisee, named Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God is with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So there's going to take two things. First of all, there's going to take the cleansing of the heart. It's going to have to be a transformation of our lives so that our outward appearance is going to be based upon our inward feelings and our inward concepts toward God and toward our fellow man. That's first. Then there's going to have to be the changing of our, our physical mortal body to a spirit body. Then we will be able to see the spirit realm because we will have entered that realm. We will be spirit ourselves. Transformation of the heart first. And it precedes the transformation of the physical mortal body. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll just skip the rest of those verses. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 to 54. 1 Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So you see, the purity of the heart comes first while we're living in this fleshly existence. After the purity of the heart comes, only will come the change from mortal to immortality. And God is going to know the hearts first. Now I feel that I have established that purity in heart is what God wants. Not a double standard. 
None whatsoever. There cannot be out of our mouth speaking one thing to one of you and then turn around and speak to something altogether different to someone else. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 4 and let's look at something interesting here. And we've also seen that only the pure in heart are going to see God. And that's going to come the pure heart first, then the change of this body. Matthew, or I'm sorry, not Matthew, Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. And when Jesus was alone, they that were about him with the twelve, so here were followers of Jesus Christ, and they asked of him the parable, and it's a parable he had just given in the first nine verses. And he said unto them, Unto you, handpicked disciples that are following me, Jesus, it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, those that are outside this group that Jesus Christ is picking, these things are done in parables. Verse 12, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand. Why in the world would God allow some people to understand and others not? What made these people different? that they should understand the mystery of the kingdom of God and the other people could not comprehend it. And what does their understanding of this mystery that's Jesus talking about, the mystery of the kingdom, have to do with their treatment and our treatment of Jesus Christ from the heart? Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Verse 25 and 26. Romans 11, verse 25 and 26. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. I want to stop there just for a minute. The word mystery in the Greek language means secret. So this is a secret that's going on in the earth. Certain people have been chosen to understand this secret, this mystery. Others that have not been chosen to understand this mystery have no comprehension that it's even taking place, that it's even being worked out. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So God is selecting today whom he wants from all nations of the earth. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So these two verses, especially verse 25, shows that there is a mystery. There is a secret being worked out that most people have no comprehension of. And it's only those that God is picking here and there that are going to understand this mystery. Now look in verse 28 and 29, the same chapter. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Here are the Israel, physical Israel, as well as the rest of the nations of the earth that have not been handpicked. But notice the next phrase. But as touching the election. There is an elect that God is calling today to understand. And nobody else will understand this secret, this mystery that's being worked out. And this is why it's so important that we comprehend that our treatment of Jesus is going to determine our entrance into that kingdom and our treatment of Jesus from the heart and, when we, and how we treat Jesus and his fellow followers and disciples. Because you see, none of us have seen Jesus and yet we see each other right here. And there is a scripture, I didn't write it down, but you can look it up, and it states very clearly, how can you or me love God whom we've never seen if we can't love one another whom we have seen you see so our, our entrance into the kingdom is going to be determined on how we treat one another we see each other we've never seen God and Jesus now I'll continue they are beloved for the father's sake this is the election for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance the election those chosen today cannot ever not even contemplate turning back once they understand that there is a secret 
There is a mystery, and once it's revealed to you, you cannot turn back and reject that mystery. When you know what God's doing, there is no place for you in the world anymore. If you go back to the world, there is nothing but a sure fire waiting for you. And it is called the lake of fire. Judgment from God comes upon you and me once the secret is revealed to you. And you comprehend it and you know you know it. See? You have to know it and know that you know it and then there is no turning back for you. This is dangerous information. It is. Because if you know it, and you know that you know, there is no way you can retreat. Otherwise, there is no entrance into the kingdom for you. Then your entrance into the kingdom is predicated upon your treatment of your brethren. See? Because Jesus Christ has called those brethren. He's revealed this secret to them. He said, look, you are the election. I've handpicked you to be in the kingdom. Therefore, you treat your brother and your sister from the heart as if you're looking at me personally. You see? And this is the way that we're going to have to live or else we will be rejected. Romans chapter 16. Romans 16. Verse 25 and 26. Now to him that, ha that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. See? This has been a secret. It has been a mystery. And no one has comprehended it since the world began unless God picked that person to understand it. Verse 26, but now is made manifest. It's made known. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So God has the power to establish you to enter his kingdom once he's revealed this mystery. Once he's removed all secrecy from you and you know what he's doing then you have opportunity to enter into that kingdom. And the determining factor will be how you treat his disciples whom you see. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. How is this mystery revealed to you and to me? Because it is a mystery. The Bible said so. And it said it had been kept secret since the beginning of the world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 7. <clears throat> verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You see, if this had not been a mystery hidden from everybody in the world, there would never have been a crucifixion of Jesus Christ. There would never have been any sacrifice for the sins of this world. Therefore, there could not have been any salvation. God had to keep this mystery hidden, covered, and only reveal it to a few here and there. Verse 9, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. You see, the physical senses cannot comprehend the things of God. The, the sight, the taste, the touch that cannot comprehend God. Verse 10, But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. This is God's Spirit. And if God's Holy Spirit does not enter in some way and draw you and allow you to understand, you can preach to somebody from now on and they'll never get it. They'll never comprehend if God's Spirit is not working with them to reveal this mystery. That's why it's so frustrating for us sometimes to want to tell all of our relatives what we know and they can't comprehend. If God is not choosing them to be of the election today, they'll not get it. Verse 11, For what man knows the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. 
God's Spirit reveals things of God. Otherwise, human beings separate and apart from God's Holy Spirit cannot comprehend. They just cannot. And so why should we force it upon them? When God draws them, we go preach. And then whomever God is drawing will use that voice to bring those people to a knowledge of the truth. Verse 12. We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, uh, teaches but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual with spiritual. You see? We cannot, as human beings, compare spiritual with with physical because you have an exact opposite and brethren you cannot look at other people that are disciples of Jesus Christ and look at their physical state in life and determine their spirituality you cannot do it verse 14 but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness unto him Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. That's why they're going to have concentration camps for you and me. That's why they're going to put, the, put us in them because they, they cannot comprehend the spiritual things that we comprehend. Therefore, to them, we are mentally unbalanced. We have mental problems. And the only way those mental problems will be solved or the only way they can solve the problem of us in society is to remove us from society when this one world government comes. And they're already doing it in the United States. Verse 15, But he that is spiritual, and hopefully that's going to be all of us, judges all things. Now the word judge is a mistranslation. It should be discern. Discern. Yet he is, himself is discerned of no man. We can go into a crowd if we truly have God's Holy Spirit and we can listen to the conversation and we can determine to a degree who has God's Spirit and who doesn't just for the things that come out of their mouth because they'll always point to themselves as someone. They're always talking about the physical, the fleshly. They're always talking about the physical appetites. Usually it ends up being sexual overtones in just about every crowd you go into. You can determine these things, but they can't determine you. See, they can't discern that you're different than they are except you won't participate in their sins. And that makes you different. Verse 16, For who has known the mind of the Lord but he, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, I want to stop here for just a minute and make some comments on this. Because it says right here that if God's Holy Spirit reveals spiritual information to you, you have the mind of Christ, right? You have the mind of Christ. Okay, I want to go back just a couple of pages to Romans chapter 8, read verse 9 and 10. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Romans 8 verse 9. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If an individual, I don't care how religious he acts outwardly, and usually the less spiritual you are, the more you have to pretend outwardly. <laughs> it's just something I've observed through the years. But anyway, because you know if you are spiritual inside, you don't have to go around and make a show and try to hold your hands real sweet and nice. No, because you're just acting the way God wants you to. And as one person said to me one day, Dave, meekness is not weakness. So you don't have to go around with your hands folded and sweet, talk sweet, you know, and that kind of things to show that you're spiritual. Oh no, it's only when you're not spiritual and you have to pretend that you do these things. Well anyway, if you do not have God's Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. You're not. And yet, we don't want to go around and tell people you don't have God's Spirit. Oh no, we'll let Christ end up at the resurrection determining who had his spirit and who didn't. See, we can only discuss spiritual things with anybody who wants to discuss them. And then it's up to them to determine what is truth or not. And then they will have to make all their decisions based upon the Bible and their sincerity as to whether they want truth or they want tradition of men instead of truth. 
Now verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. So all of our sins are forgiven. Therefore God looks at you as a perfect individual. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, your judgment as to whether you will enter the kingdom is based upon your treatment of Jesus Christ from the heart or anyone who has the mind of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. And it's how we treat one another because Christ in you. What does that mean? That means God life is now engendered in you as one of the very elect. Now, that terrifies me to think that I would ever say, and yet I know I do, and all of us do because we still have this physical body and we haven't rooted out all the, uh, the works of the flesh. But still, it terrifies me to think that I would do anything to someone who has the mind of Christ. Because, you see, my salvation is being based upon my treatment of every son and daughter of God from the heart. And if I can't treat you with a right attitude from the heart, the way Jesus Christ would treat you, or I would treat Jesus Christ, then I'm a hypocrite. You see? And hypocrisy has no place in the kingdom of God. No place. Matthew chapter 25 again, where we started. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. Here is a resurrection. But who will be in this particular resurrection? Because when Jesus comes, it's only for the first fruits, the elect. It's not for the whole world. I've given many, many sermons showing that there is coming a resurrection to physical life. I want to show that right now in just one scripture before we go on. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel 37. I'm only going to summarize through parts of this. Verse 1 talks about a valley of dry bones. Verse 2, there's many, many individuals or bones in that valley. Verse 3, the question is asked, Son of man, can these bones live? And the answer from Ezekiel was, Lord, you know. You're the only one that knows. Verse 5, Thus says the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. That's a physical resurrection. I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. This is a physical resurrection and it's going to take place after Jesus Christ comes to this earth. That's when all of those individuals that have been blinded through the centuries are going to have opportunity to understand what you and I are learning today. After Christ comes. But it's also after Christ comes as when that election at that last trump is when the election is given that spirit body. Now who is it that's going to be given that spirit body and who is it that is going to enter into that kingdom? Back to Matthew 25 and let's look at verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is only first fruits, the election today. Not all of those masses of humanity who do not have the truth of God, who have never learned it, their minds have not been opened by the Holy Spirit. They will receive their opportunity after Christ comes. Now drop down to verse 40 and let's read it for ourselves to see who is going to enter into this kingdom. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So we have treated our own brethren from the heart. Those who have the mind of Christ as if they were Jesus in person. I think that's a tremendous concept. And if we do that, wouldn't that silence most of the problems in the church? 
<laughs> I think it would just solve every problem that we have. Because which one of us, if we actually believe that the mind of Christ was in every other person, and we talk to that person, and that's Christ there, because it's Christ in us, see? And if we believe that we were talking to Jesus Christ in person, that old double standard would never come out, would it? We would subjugate it and let God clean us from the inside out until we were pure. If I look at you and I think, well, that's the person with the mind of Christ, that's Jesus in that person. Now, would you refuse the physical necessities of life to Jesus? If you had a way to help your brother or sister or to help Jesus, would you refuse them? If you were talking to Jesus in person, would you say derogatory words about him? Would you slander Jesus? Would you gossip behind his back about Jesus? Would you use Jesus' name in vain, light in jokes, in a joking manner? I think all these are legitimate questions that each one of us have to face because every one of us must be cleansed from the inside out or we're not going to see God. We're not going to be changed from a flesh mortal body to a spirit fully clothed with spirit composition body that will now be immortal as God the Father and Jesus are immortal. They're the only two with immortality right now, and it says so in 1 and 2 Timothy. It says, so, it says we're seeking immortality now in Romans 2, verse 7 and 8. Now let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, Galatians, Ephesians. Start in verse 9, and let's go down through verse 14. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. So here's God and here's Jesus. He is the one who's revealing this mystery to us. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. So Christ is doing everything. He's going to gather the world in himself. And if we're looking at Jesus... And when we look at each other, we look and say, okay, Christ is in that person, then we're not going to mistreat them, are we? Okay, this makes a big difference when we view each other from a proper perspective. Both which are in heaven, so here God the Father is going to gather everything through Jesus that are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. This is us, the elect, being predestined. God has predestined to call a certain elect today before salvation is offered to the rest of the world when Jesus rules for 1,000 years. We're predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. You see, this is why this mystery is being revealed because you and I are first trusting in Christ. That's why we are going to have, according to Hebrews 11, a better resurrection. Because the rest of the world today is not trusting in Christ. Therefore, God is going to give a better resurrection to anyone who trusts Him while Satan is loose, while we still have our own human nature, while the rest of the world is being ruled by Satan and his demons. It's an uphill climb against everything in the world. And he's going to give us a better resurrection. Verse 13, In whom you also trusted, this is Jesus, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you were believed, you were sealed with a Holy Spirit of promise. And what is the Holy Spirit of promise? Verse 14, Which is the earnest of our inheritance. It's a down payment on a full spirit body. We don't have a spirit body yet. We've only got a little bit, a little down payment, an earnest of the spirit in us. And we're waiting for that last trump so that we can be clothed with a fully spirit body. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Now Christ came to gather into one 
Family in heaven, that's God. And on earth, that's humans. That's you and me, the elect. This means humans, if we are to become mortal, just like God the Father and Jesus, these elect that God is calling today are to be born, as it said in John 3, verse 1 to 8, as full-fledged sons and become sons of God. This means, just like God is God, Jesus is God, but he's the Son of God, now are we sons of God, but it'll not yet appear what we shall be, because we don't have that spirit body. That means we too will be gods. Is that blasphemy? Oh no, I've read scripture after scripture that said so. So our treatment from the heart of potential sons of God is what is going to determine our entrance into the kingdom. That's exactly what is going to determine our entrance. And I think this is a tremendous and an awesome concept if we can just comprehend it, then it'll change our attitude and our approach toward one another. You see, God's Spirit is our down payment until Christ returns to give us a full-fledged spirit body. That's what will make us a God, just like God is God and Jesus is God. And until that time comes, we are only in the flesh, we're in secret right now in a world without God. And we're like an ambassador representing a spirit kingdom on this earth. And God is going to recall his ambassadors at the seventh trump. And when he call, recalls his ambassadors, only those who from the heart have treated one another properly are going to meet him with a full-fledged spirit body at that sea of glass. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, verse 3 to 9. How that by revelation, this is a revealing. He made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. See, before Christ came into the world, this mystery that he's working out and the election, you and me, to become sons of God, very gods to work with Jesus to rule for a thousand years. Read Revelation 20, verse 4 to 6. Revelation 5, 10, he's made us kings and priests and we shall rule on the earth. We're the ones through Jesus that's going to bring salvation to the rest of the world. And if you don't have God's spirit, that's going to be a tough statement to comprehend. <laughs> it just is. It's going to sound like blasphemy. But... When you have the Spirit of God and this mystery is revealed, then you will know what God is doing. Verse, verse 4, let's read the whole, or 5, read the whole verse. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by his, or by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, so you see, God is going to save the world through Israel, but first he's going to choose from all nations, and then those people from all nations will be gods. And then we will de deal with all other nations of the earth in the thousand-year reign of Christ. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift, and I'll skip that verse, verse uh, 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of the all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God. See, it was always been hidden. Who created all things by Jesus. Now, this secret was to be revealed on a worldwide scale at a later time. Only to those who will receive it and understand it will receive entrance into that kingdom. And it's all going to be based upon our contact with one another, the treatment that we give to each other, and it's got to be from the heart. This means our total living environment is what is going to be judged. Not just when you come to church and you're with a fellow brother, but it's what you're going to do out there. 
Because you see, when God raises from the dead all those who have not received salvation, who is it that's going to be teaching them? You. If your conduct is anything less than godly before them today, won't they have a legitimate question as to why you're in the kingdom? So brethren, this has got to be totality of our being every moment that we're awake. There can be no double standard at any time. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32 and 33. Now, we all have to remember that we do slip because we're still flesh. I'm talking about the ideal right now. <laughs> None of us will live up to the ideal, but we can strive to. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. Why? Because if she has God's Holy Spirit, you're looking at a potential God. And wives, when you look at your husband, if he has God's Holy Spirit, you're looking at a potential God. Are we going to mistreat that individual? I hope not deliberately. And the wife, see that she reverence her husband. So the husband is commanded with all of his heart to love his wife, to protect her, take care of her, as if it was his own body. And so as a result, the wife, because he's going to try his best to do those things, she will have respect and reverence to her husband. Therefore, the two of them can work together as a team toward God's kingdom. Because you see, our judgment that's going to determine our entrance into the kingdom is how we treat one another and Christ in us. Well, once this mystery or secret is known to you, you are responsible for your treatment of every other human being that you will ever meet and it's got to be genuine from the heart it cannot be fake it's got to be from the heart now look at this next scripture Colossians 1 26 and 27 Colossians 1 here's the mystery even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is, here's the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in every person that has truly repented and has gone down in that watery grave of baptism and has left all of his sins behind. He's been resurrected out of that water to live a new life. And when Christ's Spirit comes in you, then that's the secret. You're walking around in an alien world. And you're waiting as an ambassador of Jesus Christ to be recalled to the sea of glass, given your spirit body, so that you can go down and establish the true government of God on earth. And how can we mistreat one another if we comprehend this? Colossians 2, verse 2 and 3 that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and into all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God is reproducing Himself through humans. He is creating sons of God and judgment is going to be upon us based upon our treatment of one another. Because Christ is living in you or else you are a bastard. It's a strong term, but it's true. I'm going to read it out of the Bible to you. And that treatment, brethren, has got to be sincerely. I can't talk to you one moment and turn around and cut you down in another moment. That's not sincerity. That's a double standard. And that judgment is upon me if I do such a thing and upon you. Colossians 4, verse 3 to 6. With all praying, also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I, also, I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. You see, we're to walk in wisdom toward people that are not Christians yet, because when they come in, in, up in the resurrection, 
if they know your conduct and you're a hypocrite and God were to allow you to go into the kingdom, they would have a legitimate complaint as to why you're there and they're not. So no hypocrisy should be found in us. Verse 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. That's a preserving agent that you may know how you ought to answer every man. And it better be seasoned because judgment is upon us now. 1 Timothy 3, verse 9. 1 Timothy 3, verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let the, these also first be proved, and then let them use the office of a deacon. See? So here is the qualifications of elders and deacons, and it says that we are to hold this mystery, and we must hold it, and it must be exemplified by our lives before we can ordain someone as a minister or a deacon. They must understand this mystery and their lives be converted from inside out so that they will treat every other human being as if they were talking to Christ in person. And if we'll do that, we will solve all problems in the church. There will be no envy, no jealousy, no strife. None of the works of the flesh will rear their ugly heads. Now, verse 16 of the same chapter. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, that was Christ, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, believed, uh, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up to glory. So God is living in us. That's the mystery. It's this Jesus that's already been resurrected. He came in a human flesh first. Now his spirit is coming into us. That's why judgment is based upon our treatment of Christ and the way we treat one another and Christ in us. Now, Revelation 7, verse 10. 7, verse 10. This is just a simple scripture. And it shows the return of Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm sorry, 10, verse 7. 10 verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he's declared to his servants, the prophets. So here is the return of Jesus Christ. Then we'll know for absolute assurity who from the inside out has been converted because they are the only ones that are going to be caught up to the sea of glass before the throne of God, to the marriage supper of the Lamb, clothed with a new spirit body, and then a portion rulership over this earth at that last trump. Now, brethren, why do I mention all these things? Because if the rest of the world are not going to be judged until Jesus returns, they're resurrected to physical life. He's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Then they're going to know God. They're going to have an opportunity for salvation. When are you going to be judged? You see, if you're going to already have a spirit body, when are you going to be judged? Well, 1 Peter 4, verse 12 to 19. 1 Peter 4, verse 12 to 19. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange things happen unto you. These are Christians. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Why? Because you're going to have a spirit body. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. You see, if you're living a righteous life and you're reproached and you're put in prison or maybe you're killed for the name of Jesus when you've done nothing wrong, that's fine. That's happy. The next thing you'll know is you'll wake up in the resurrection. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he's evil spoken of. But on your part, Jesus is glorified. Verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. In other words, the works of the flesh, violation of God's laws, Christians should never participate in those things. Verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come, that's right now, 
that judgment must begin at the house of God. Brethren, you and I today, everything we speak, think, every action we take, judgment is being passed upon us right now. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, that's us. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Brethren, this is important because judgment is upon the church today. Every one of us is being judged in relationship as to how we treat one another and others outside the church because it's Christ in you. Now, Revelation 2, verse 23. Then I want to get down to the conclusion of this. Revelation 2, <clears throat> verse 23. And I'll kill her children with death. This is Jesus showing that people who are not faithful in one of the churches of Revelation, they were not faithful, so he's going to bring great tribulation upon them they're going to have to repent of their deeds. He said, I'll kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he that searches the reins and the hearts. God is going to know you and me. He is not going to allow a double standard in our life. He's going to know us. He said, I'll give unto every one of you according to your works. I admonish you also to read Psalms 26 verse 2 where he says he will try our hearts. He'll try them. He's going to know you. He knew Abraham. He said, now I know. And he's going to know you. In Jeremiah 11 verse 20 he also said, I'm going to know you. Now here's one I do want to turn to. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 and 10. <clears throat> Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is the way we were before Christ in us through the power of His Holy Spirit began to convert and to change us. Now verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the rain, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So we had best change our life internally and then our exterior posture and our actions toward one another will show righteousness from the inside out. Now, what happens? My concluding section today, what happens if Christ tries our reins and hearts and finds us a little short? A little shorter than he wants us to be on the proper love toward one another. What happens if he finds some of this desperately wicked heart still within us? Maybe just a little. And we're not living up to the standard that he wants for us to enter into that kingdom. In Hebrews chapter 12, he gives us the answer. Hebrews chapter 12. He's going to know us. He's going to try us. And if we're come up short, he's going to convert us. <clears throat> or else, he will cast us away. Hebrews chapter 12 starting in verse 1 through 5. Wherefore, seeing you also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, that's chapter 11, the faith chapter, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, actually should be beginner and finisher, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Look, we can't lose heart and give up just because we're going to be rebuked of God because we're going to see in the next few verses when we fall short, God as our Father will rebuke us. He will chastise us. Verse 4. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Jesus did. He sweat great drops of blood. The capillaries broke in his forehead and ran down his face. He was sweating because he knew the salvation of the human race was on the line. He either obeyed and went all the way, or you and I would have no salvation. We haven't resisted like that. And yet God says, I want you not to be discouraged and grieved. 
Now, starting in verse 5, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastisement or chast chastising of the Lord, nor faint when you're rebuked of him. Now, let's review how does God rebuke us? How does he chastise us? I'm only going to list a few superficial ways. You sit down and think about even deeper ways. Number one, the Bible shows us our works. Therefore, we repent when we see we're wrong. These are just many outward things. The works of the flesh and so on. Sermons from the ministry shows us many times what we're doing wrong. They're directed for every one of us. And so we can correct ourselves. Open Bible studies that bring out many points that some of us never think about, but one person thinks about it and brings it up and we all discuss it. That helps us to grow and to change. Also, circumstances in our lives that produce faith and patience, trials that we go through, these are corrective methods that God uses. It's a one-on-one -on -one correction also from a brother or sister who's been sinned against. We go to that person and we discuss it. We grow that way. We see the fault in our life and we change. Also, if someone won't change, then we take two or three with them and as witnesses to show the, the error of their way. If they change, then that person has grown, right? They've been chastised and they've been corrected of God. Then if no other way, it has to go to the entire church so the whole church can judge concerning the matter of misconduct on a person's part. If that person changes and recognizes his fault, he also is receiving chastisement from the Lord. God does it in many, many ways. You can list other ways. You do that. Also, God's Holy Spirit reveals mistakes to you through various circumstances. That's done. Now, let's go to verse 6 through 8. For whom the Lord loves, he, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Brethren, if everything is so rosy with you and never one thing ever goes wrong in your life and there's never chastisement, you're in trouble. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it is. Because if God loves you, He sees what's wrong with you. He's going to get it to your attention one way or, the, or another. So He's going to chastise you. Verse 7, if you endure chastening, you notice if showing there is doubt in some cases, because some of us have such sins in our lives, it is doubtful that we can correct them when we're rebuked. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chastens not? Now, verse 8. Well, let me stop there just for a minute. No, I'll read verse 8. But if you be without chastisement, whereof are all partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. You see? So either God is going to correct you over and over and over until our heart is right with Him, preparing us for the entrance into His kingdom, or else we're going to be bastards and we're going to be left out of the kingdom. You see, because we have no father. Now, verse 9, 10, and 11. Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh, and this whole verse talks about how they chastise us and how correction takes place. Then verse 10. For verily... For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Do you see that? The very purpose for correction is so that we can be partakers of God's and Jesus' holiness. You see? Now verse 11. No chastening for the present seems to be joyous. It is not. It overwhelms us. It's really grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, and here's the wonderful part, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Brethren, it hurts terribly to be chastised. But afterward, it produces peace in our life, the peaceable fruit of righteousness. But only, the only way it will ever produce it is if we admit the sins and were exercised by it that means change and be corrected then the peace of God can come into our life and brethren once we've done this verse 22 to 25 is my concluding scripture you are come unto Mount Zion unto the city of the living God 
the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, that's us, which are written in heaven, or enrolled, and to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel, see that you refuse not him that speaks. Brethren, when we're chastised, make sure we don't refuse the chastisement, otherwise we will end up being bastards. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, that was Moses and the children of Israel, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven. Brethren, let's make sure that we are seeking God with all of our heart, soul, and being with a pure heart. And if God finds us short, which he will, weekly, monthly, yearly, then when he chastises us, let's correct ourselves so that he will not have to bring on yet more chastisement. 